Good afternoon for those who are in Europe and in uh, the Middle East. Good evening for those who are in Asia and good morning for those who are in the uh, Western Hemisphere. It is a pleasure and honor for all of us to have you with us for this uh, 23rd Global Digital Encounter dedicated to IP and cybersecurity. This is a very, very exceptional moment. Why? Because the topic of IP and cybersecurity is one of the most thrilling ones among uh, the topics that are covered uh, by the international community in close relation with, uh, with intellectual property developments. So as such, the big idea for us today is to reply to a certain number of questions, uh, of questions uh, that are connected to uh, cybersecurity, uh, which cybersecurity for IP, how to keep IP assets protected against cybersecurity breaches, which relationship between cybersecurity and the UN agency in IP, WIPO, uh, and why it may matter for WIPO. Why is cybersecurity so essential for innovative IP business? And how to relate IP to uh, privacy and other areas that are so important for cybersecurity issues. In order to uh, run this 23rd uh, Global Digital Encounter, uh, we, uh, Manuel Desantes, who is the co-director of this uh, Global Digital Encounter program with me, Laurent Manderieux, we, uh, FIDE Foundation and uh, uh, Transatlantic Intellectual Property IP Academy, we have pulled our forces and we have brought for uh, you today an exceptional panel. This panel is uh, uh, composed of Richard Lane, who is the uh, uh, Chief uh, of Cybersecurity at WIPO and performs many of the duties related to uh, the development of uh, uh, cybersecurity. Um, and also we have with us Dean Talzarski from the University of Haifa. Uh, as Dean of the University of Haifa and as Professor of Law, he's played a key role over uh, the last decade or decades in um, paving the way for understanding the uh, important relationship between cybersecurity, between tech issues and IP and other branches of law. So we really have with us an absolutely exceptional panel. We have people connected from the, the entire planet to this event. The event is moderated again, uh, I mentioned it again, by my esteemed colleague, Professor Manuel de Santes, the, from the University of Alicante and former Vice President of the European Patent Office. The big objective today is not to exhaust the topic of uh, IP and cybersecurity, but simply to open appetite for questions, research, and so on. And this is why we have brought with us this exceptional panel. So thank you to our speakers for uh, being with us and to our moderator. Also, I would wish to uh, take the opportunity to um, um, thank all our uh, supporters all over the world who permit this program, this pro bono activity, to develop uh, in a smooth way and with many, many participants logged in from all continents, either online or subsequently. So I would give the floor to the coordinator of the activity uh, and the two co-directors, Professor uh, Javier fernandez Laschetti, who, will, who wants also to uh, say a few words at the start of this meeting. Javier, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, just a few words as usual, you know, well, uh, cybersecurity is part of our life, uh, so, or it should be part of our life in modern, modern times we are living. So uh, it's not surprisingly that uh, uh, should be part of the IP issues we are dealing with. If you consider the processes of research and innovate, research and development, innovation in general, trade secrets, and so on and so forth, you will share with me the idea that uh, Cybersecurity is a must, so that's why it's, it's very important. The 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 the, the uh, digital encounter encounter of today is is very important. As uh, as Laurent has, has said, we 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 
we will not exhaust all the issues, but we'll treat some of them, and probably this will be part of another uh, encounter in the future. But we have two panelists uh, and uh, and uh, moderator that will bring us uh, some light into some of the most important issues. And uh, thank you very much for being part of the community. You remember that you participate in our community and uh, you can share ideas, papers, documents, etc., whatever you want. So, uh, Manuel, my dear friend, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody all around the world. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Tal, for being here with us. Welcome to the family. Uh, we will uh, work uh, together and discuss together on these exciting topics for about uh, 30 minutes, and then we will listen uh, very attentively the questions of the attendants. Uh, I am I am here at home, surrounded surrounded, I should say, by my dog. It's her time to be walk, so I guess that she will not disturb a lot. Uh, Richard, uh, you. You are the Chief Security Officer of the World Intellectual Property Organization and being involved in so many decades, I should say, in, in all these matters. Uh, so uh, the first question could come to my mind is, what is the relationship between cybersecurity and, and WIPO? I mean, why cybersecurity is a matter for WIPO? Yeah? And uh, I, I'd like to address this question specifically to you, but I would like also to tell uh, to give uh, his views on this on this matter. Well, thank you, Manuel. And uh, I guess as the Australian on the panel, it's uh, just easier to say good day rather than uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to join this panel and join this community. It's my first uh, digital encounter, so I'm looking forward to it. So the question of why security and cybersecurity in particular is is uh, important to WIPO and why we're concerned about it is is um, quite a fundamental one to how the organization operates. I mean, at the end of the day, we are custodians of highly confidential, highly sensitive, very valuable data from all of our customers, be it as patents or uh, industrial designs or other uh, IP related filings. So. We take the protection of that information incredibly seriously. Of our enterprise risks, cybersecurity are number one and number two of the top five. So the uh, the impact of an incident on WIPO could be catastrophic, depending on the type of incident. And we'll get into, into into the types of incidents like ransomware further on down the line. So we have a huge reputational risk around cybersecurity. Um, so, it, if we are failing in, in protecting that information, if we have a breach of some form and we don't respond accordingly, um, it would have catastrophic imp impact potentially to us as an organization, but also to all of the, uh, all of the filers, the inventors, the small inventors through to the large companies who have trusted us with that, uh, that data. Uh -huh. Thank you, Richard. Tal, do you want to add something to? Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we see cybersecurity is also an area we where we need to see global initiatives, um, and there's a, a paucity of uh, efficient uh, international cooperation. And clearly, WIPO, being an international organization and a hub of excellence, could also move forward in bringing knowledge and parties around the world uh, together on this issue. Another point I want to mention is that Richard mentioned that WIPO is, um, has an inventory of a great deal of information, and some of that information is personal, some of that information is public, some of it, it is private. And um, WIPO, as many other uh, international Institutes such as uh, ICANN, which are um, vested with an authority of guarding information, making it public, uh, keeping it private, balancing between them, also must uh, make a decision how much information it wants to keep, how much information is essential for its operations, how much information it wants to open up to the public, thus possibly enabling cyber attacks for others and how much is not essential. And 
every balance for every institution is unique um, and leads to interesting questions of policy for WIPO, in, in my opinion. Uh -huh. I, I, and I'll, can I just uh, respond to that? Because um, we as, uh, as WIPO, we are governed, if you like, by the various IP treaties, PCT Treaty, Hague, Madrid, which have mandated in there the levels of protection for the data and how long it's kept, what can be published, what can't be published, etc. So it's not really something that we as an organization make the decision on. We, we are mandated to follow the, the, uh, the, the treaties, even though we're in a very unique situation compared to the national IP offices, for example, because of being a UN agency. We're not governed by, you know, we are, we are ex-jurisdictional. We are uh, we have the immunities and privileges that are accorded to the UN agencies in terms of the application of legislation. So it is very difficult to prosecute some, a UN ag agency, shall we say, for example. But we are governed, however, by the requirements of these treaties. So it's not a, it's not us defining the security policy around that data. We apply the policy that is is brought forward in those treaties. Uh -huh. So what I can conclude is that according to your experience, both Richard and, and Tal, uh, cyber security is an issue which gains attention year after year in public international organizations like WIPO. Yeah? But what about uh, innovative IP businesses, uh, Tal? Is, is cyber, do you, do you have the, the feeling that cybersecurity has become also an issue on, on innovative uh, business, especially innovative intellectual property businesses? No, you have, uh, Tal, yeah. I, I also, I wanna apologize for muting myself and I, I think I was impolite, I didn't thank uh, the organizers and and Richard for this very interesting event and for bringing me into your community. So I'm saying so now. Now, in terms of the excellent question you you asked, um, there's a lot of writing in in various disciplines that are pointing out what is the needed environment for having a successful, innovative uh, society or corporation. Um, and one of the many elements pointed out is uh, data privacy and data security, which will um, allow individuals to flourish. And we could look at it from the other way around. If individuals are operating in an environment when they know that they might suffer repercussions of privacy breaches or security breaches, this will no doubt tax their innovation. And we know many stories in which corporations, they had these massive hacks and people uh, were shamed as to the inner discourse that they have. And we know that the innovative process is ones of personal exploration, perhaps, um, and where people want to share ideas openly. And the fact that they might be subject, exposed to scrutiny and perhaps mockery by other entities is um, clearly something that will hamper innovation. And we could even look beyond that, right? If we know that a firm uh, has a risk that its innovations will be compromised by a hack and therefore will be passed on to other entities at zero cost. So that clearly uh, decreases their innovation to innovate. So I think it's quite clear that there's uh, uh, there should be a correlation and a, a clear line between the level of security that a society or an infrastructure provides and the level of innovation that will transpire and thus to, to, to end this long-winded answer, um, clearly entities <coughs> that are interested in promoting innovation should be interested in enabling a secure uh, um, infrastructure and environment as well. Thank you, Tal. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 would, have, I would have to agree there, particularly with that last point. Um, Security is an enabler for for innovation, for business. Um, for a long time, it's been seen as the policeman, you know, stop, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. So, you know, everyone's in there going, well, what, what can we do? 
when I first joined WIPO 14 years ago, that was very much the mentality of the security division at the time. It was the answer is no, now what's the question? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, over time, we've managed to now move up the chain uh, to become effectively trusted advisors to the business. So we are assisting the business in growing and transforming in a secure manner so that they can fail quickly and safely. And that's, that, I think, is the key point for, for an innovative company. Yes, there is the risk of, of exposure of, of their innovation through a hack. So identify where those threats may come from and then move into protect, building protections around that that still allow you as a business to thrive. Yeah. Don't see security as a blocker. See it as a protective enabler, basically. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So if we can conclude that cybersecurity has gained relevance uh, in an exponential way, I would say, in the last years, both in international public organizations and also for innovative IP business, let, let us go a little bit more digging into more concrete uh, questions than uh, what it comes to my mind then is how, how to keep intellectual property assets protected against cybersecurity breaches. Yeah. What could be the recipe? Because this is this is for sure one of the main questions our attendants are expecting. Yeah, this okay. is okay. Hot potato. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here it comes: the silver bullet to keeping <laughs> everything secure. There is no silver bullet to keeping everything secure. Um, it the, the 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 main answer to how you know what do, what do I need to do for in security is it depends. It depends on. Your environment, it depends on the legislations you have to apply, the industry you're in. Um, it also de depends on the threats and the threat landscape that you face, the various different types of attackers. We face attacks from nation states, from organized crime, from hacktivist groups, the whole gamut. Other organizations may be very t more targeted, for example, in, if you're in pharmaceutical research, then you're going to get the hacktivists are your key or your competitors, industrial espionage. So there is no one size fits all. The key element to security, though, I find is the end user, your, in, your teams, the people, you, the, the, the physical living people in your organizations they are your first line of defense for many years people have always said you know the the security is only as strong as the weakest link and users are the weakest link well i find that insulting to be honest with you to users the users are the first line of defense and if we see them as the weakest link we as security professionals are failing them because we're not providing the right tools education and awareness for them to be able to really just think securely so you can get you you know you can you can spend millions on firewalls and detection systems and prevention systems and incident response and have policies 350 pages thick that no one ever reads but uses to keep use to keep the door open in the summer but if your end users are unaware of how to behave securely then it all becomes for nothing because all it takes is one person clicking on a phishing email that will open up the floodgates, basically. The way we look at it is how secure is secure enough? And when we're building our security and, and identifying the components that we use, we use a particular archi security architectural framework called SABSA. Um, that allows for end-to-end -end, um, linkage between a business need for security and the security components. And so that we're never applying too much security because that can be a killer. Okay. Um, and then we're also making sure that all of the business needs are met from the security perspective. From the threat landscape, I mentioned that we, you know, the threat actors that we're facing, but one of the, the biggest threats that we have is, is uh, particularly around the, the, the sphere of ransomware. Um, you know, if, if you think about it, the, the, the sensitive information that we have, the unpublished IP filings that we're, the, we're custodians for, if those were to be captured and exfiltrated by, by an attacker um, and then held to ransom with maybe publishing a little bit of it and then encrypting some of it and everything, 
the reputational fallout for that could turn it into effectively an existential event for us as an organization. But not only for us, and this is what keeps me not sleeping greatly at night, mm -hmm. because although there's an impact to WIPO, there's an impact to all of our customers as well. All of the all of the inventors, all of the companies who have, have submitted those findings, if they are published early, the impact could be quite catastrophic as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. Tal, do you want to add something here? Yes, thank you. So I want to add a, a few points. First of all, in terms of uh, promoting cybersecurity, we perhaps should say some words about the role of regulation. Um, and as we see the spread of uh, GDPR and its influence around the world, I think I should mention two key points in GDPR, two or three points regarding the way GDPR through its regulation promotes cybersecurity and thus affects uh, IP rights. One is by setting cyber security standards and enforcing them and thus according to the gdpr um, you must abide by a state-of-the-art level which will change according to context and obviously uh, local regulators will have their say on this as well as standard setters and if you fail to meet these standards and still are subjected to a breach um, you can be subject to uh, fines the second point that we also see going uh, around the world, even beyond the EU and to a great extent extends in the US and many other countries is breach notification. Um, and uh, this has been having some effect. It's not only in privacy laws, but many other laws. Um, and um, it's an interesting question to think to what extent is this uh, tool helpful in promoting the incentives to protect uh, IP rights, the intuition is clear, especially in an IP context, that um, the prospect of having to report on this breach uh, will intimidate uh, the in creator of infrastructure and thus um, incentivize them to put in place stronger cybersecurity measures. Okay. Uh, I wanted also, if I may, to react quickly on this notion of ransomware, which is very close to, to my heart. And uh, I, I agree with Richard that this is a substantial risk. And, and I want to make a, a few points. First of all, uh, I want us to think for a moment on about the negative uh, thought that we will be subjected at one point to a ransomware attack. And um, I know there are people here from various sectors and roles, and I want to set forth the notion that perhaps when we think about a ransomware attack that might lead to the negative outcome that Richard uh, mentioned, that not only might we be locked out of our system, but our crown jewels, our IP rights, will be presented and leaked to many others. And it will be very in, um, important at this point when you need to make a decision, how do you react to the attack, not to leave it only in the hands of the lawyers, all due respect, or to the security people, or even management, but given the things that Richard is talking about, perhaps the people dealing with IP at the firm need to be brought into the decision-making circle in real time, giving the consequences to them. So this is something I want people to perhaps think about. Now, dealing with such an issue in real time is difficult. And thus, what I do recommend to entities that have IP-rich environments that might have ransomware attacks coming after them, not only should they be building up their security according to lines that Richard mentioned, but also should be running drills and exercises trying to figure out how do they respond to a ransomware attack. And again, at that point, bringing in real-time insights from the IP people, given the, the fact that their opinion is important. Um, and you know, because you know the IP uh, person would have a perspective after this, as to the real value of the data that might be compromised, something that the security individual, the lawyer might not have. And if, if Richard wants to say something about this, of course, I'll be happy yeah. to, to hear. Richard, I, I, well, I think I think you've I think you've nailed it quite quite handsomely there. Really, you know, um, doing exercises and drills and scenario planning and and tabletop exercises. Um, these are very very useful ways to make sure you are prepared. Bringing in the IP 
teams absolutely you know you need to be bringing in all of your various stakeholders into these exercises because they are the ones at the end of the day who are going to make the the business decisions don't leave it to the techies don't leave it to your it team your infosec team absolutely not lawyers with all due respect as well um they're, they're not the ones to be making the final decisions you, I would also advise in certain cases looking at engaging external companies. There are some out there that can can provide incident response and act as intermediaries with the ransom demander. Um, don't just pay is my key point. Uh-huh. Don't just pay because over 65% of people in the last 12 months that have paid ransom their ransom are subject to another attack within inside two or three months because they are they become known as someone who will pay. So they're a cash cow target, and then, you know. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> understand. Good. That's a that's an issue. Could we can we can discuss further if there are questions uh, to all the attendants. Please, the question line is open, and uh, and you can start at any time asking us questions, and we will prioritize them. We have seen until now how cyber security could support intellectual property. Um, businesses, uh, but we can approach the matter from the other way around, from the other perspective. So, how intellectual property can uh, can protect uh, cyber security uh, innovation enterprises? Yeah, and there I would like to see the views of of you both, uh, starting by Tal. Yeah. Okay, I see we had a question here, but I'm moving forward uh, to respond to your question. Then we'll see the questions. Yeah, we will, we, um, we will see the questions later on in, in, in some minutes. Yeah, we still have ten, 10 minutes to deal with the uh, with, with the, uh, your normal conversation. And then okay, we'll... you're the boss. Uh, so in any event, my, my intuition here is um, that cybersecurity has very specific traits as a field. Um, it is quickly changing. Um, and uh, people have very specific skill sets. And um, for these reasons, perhaps the regular tools of promoting IP, such as copyright or patent, might not be the best fit. On the other hand, other tools, such as trade secret, perhaps will be playing a greater role. And thus, if you're in a company that's developing uh, cybersecurity tools, they're probably not interested in registering your patents or protecting your copyright, but you're very much interested in protecting uh, your crown jewels by keeping them uh, secret from other entities. So, so I think that classic IP plays less of a role. There are also other reasons um, because when we think about different cybersecurity uh, uh, companies, both, and, and we didn't even talk about like uh, cyber attacking uh, firms. So uh, your crown jewels might be even classified as weapons. Um, and therefore, a an, an different issue that we could perhaps talk about on a different patent is the need to receive uh, government authorization prior to using them. Do you need to share vulnerabilities with the government? Uh, and when we talk about these measures, we even understand uh, how um, classic patents are, are even less less applicable. So I think these these are the main measures. Of course, there are also issues related to trademark, uh, which is which is a protecting uh, issue. Although we do see sometimes that uh, certain companies, I'm not going to name them, um, they get sued, they get taken down, but the brands behind them just move to a different outfit. Um, so therefore, trademark might even play less of a role. And it's very much based on on expertise, um, in in my opinion. Thank you, Tal. Do you want to add something, Richard, on this matter? Well, no, I understand you are not a full expert, <laughs> here, but you are an expert on cybersecurity. Yeah, but, but I, th- I, I, I think Tal raises a raises a very good point that um, would be useful to explore in a, in another in another probably another engagement. Yeah. Um, just around the the lack of agility in many of the IP tools that are available, certainly around the patents and and you know the Hague registrations for the designs, etc. So, um, I, I I would um welcome that as a discussion another in a in a, a further um engagement certainly 
So let me okay. let me bring into the table, jump into the table with a, an elephant in the room. Yeah, when when discussing cybersecurity matters, uh, there is always the question of privacy that arrives. Yeah. So how how intellectual property relates to privacy uh, in other related areas? Yeah, while considering cybersecurity issues. Yeah, what are the potential conflicts and new views? Between cybersecurity and privacy legislation, Richard, you want to start here? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, and I, and I, I uh, bow to Tal's extensive experience on the privacy front, but uh, I'm I'm also the DPO, uh, Data Protection Officer for WIPO, so I'm getting up to speed with all the different legislations and and the uh, uh, the impacts it has. But I don't see there being it, I don't see cybersecurity and privacy as being mutually exclusive or conflicting. The security controls are there to protect the private information. The data protection controls, the privacy controls tend to be a, seen as a subset of cybersecurity. Where I see the issues is more with the IP legislation, the treaties, the requirements of the treaty for publication of, of the personal information and private data that is submitted as part of the filings, the data retention. You know, you it, it, we need to find, we need to work out how we balance the um, the requirement to publish people's <laughs> personal information as part of the filing with the right to be forgotten, as an example. Yeah. Um, you know, the right to portability can be handled quite fa fairly easily as long as the, the, the database systems are set up to do that. But if you're porting out your global patent application from WIPO to Another, um, I, I might have a problem with providing that information because that's going to a competitor, but that's a different discussion. And again, but um, no, I, I, I see, and I'd, I'd be interested, Tal, in your opinion about how we can balance the requirements of these of the IP treaties and the, and and that with the requirements of legislation like GDPR. Mm -hmm. Fair question from you, mate. <laughs> right, so. Um... <laughs> Floor is yours. Uh, we, we, uh, the GDPR's right to be forgotten has exceptions in it, and also in general, the GDPR has many derogations. Um, and um, I think it's possible within the framework uh, to come up and apply these these exceptions here. But uh, again, of course, um, I, I mentioned it earlier. We see these tensions in other contexts as well, where you have entities that have important uh, um, databases and um, there is the importance of maintaining their integrity um, and their publicity and on the other hand people come in and try to to require changes and it, it's very WIPO is in an interesting position because of its being this um, uh, supernatural uh, supernatural entity such as the UN and it's in this gray area between the GDPR and their other entities such as the Red Cross, for instance. Um, and I think that given you know the, the, the role that these entities have in promoting justice and and you know uh, uh, um, human rights, they should take upon themselves to figure out what will be the proper uh, balance. And, and my intuition is, is that they should lean towards the role of maintaining integrity in their data and promoting their various objectives, even at the price of uh, compromising these uh, data protection rights of individuals that will want to exercise their right to be uh, forgotten. But that is my, um, my uh, intuition here. I think perhaps we could say a few other words about the tension between uh, privacy and, and data security. And as Richard uh, yeah. Uh, uh, noted, uh, and I agree with him, in many instances, the interests here are aligned. Um, I'll, I'll give a recent example. There was this Irish, uh, the Irish DPA gave a decision regarding um, Instagram, a meta website, and the way that it was uh, <laughs> enabling the vast collection of personal information from children from the way they set up the defaults on their Instagram pages. So this was something that enabled a data security breach, but the way this was uh, approached from a regulatory level 
was through the duty to engage in privacy by design. They said that the design here was not private and thus this lead to this data security issue. Where we do classically see possible clashes between privacy and security is very much along the lines of what Richard mentioned. For instance, the right to um, have access to a database, which is a basic right within uh, data protection at times might create cybersecurity risks because if you want to set up a website that allows individuals to access easily information about themselves, the ease will facilitate a cybersecurity attack. However, the more you make it difficult might also say that this is compromising privacy and this very much builds into this tension, I think builds into the challenges that uh, Richard mentioned that we don't only see in the WIPO context or the IP context, we see it in many other contexts, but here is a pretty good example. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I think we have dealt already with quite an amount of issues. Each one of them merits a whole global digital encounter. So in the future, we will have much more encounters dealing with cyber security and intellectual property enforcement. Uh, but uh, we have already questions and uh, the question from the audience, my dears, go first. Uh, so if you don't mind, uh, I would like to introduce the question of Ian. Uh, he says, quick question for later. Now is the time. In the case of Colonial Pipeline, they did pay their ransomware due to the time and urgency. In your opinion, what would you recommend you will do in their situation? Also, a quite a sensitive question. Feel free to answer. Leave the country. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, yes, Colonial Pipeline was was a very public case, and yes, they <laughs> they they paid due to time and urgency. And 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 to be honest, I don't think they had a choice. Um, if they if they had taken the time to you know, even though they paid they were still they had a, a, a major impact for for quite a substantial amount of time as well so did their paying the ransomware actually reduce the time frame because the problem the other problem with paying ransom uh, as well as setting yourself up for an attack is you're never sure about the data that you get back. Mm -hmm. It's the encryption key they supply after you've paid the, uh, you know, the X number of bitcoins. Is that actually the right one? If they're returning data, are they retaining a copy? Of course they are. We know that. Um, so it, it is a very difficult situation and, it, and it, each one has to be taken on its merits. In the case of Colonial Pipeline, I think they probably did the right thing for them uh, in the long run. They haven't seen the fall, the type of fallout that that I mentioned earlier about the repeat attacking so far, and I don't. But I, you know, time has passed now, so I don't think they will. Um, but it really comes down to getting everyone around the table and discussing the pros and cons of doing that. If it was in WIPO, for example, we would be less likely to pay the pay the ransom as the UN in general. There, we don't we don't pay ransom for anything kidnapping or um so um it, it i think it, it really it really is case by case but i think in their case they probably did uh, the best thing for them yeah uh -huh. thank you tal you want to add something so i i i, I guess many people know this but it's a in the colonial pipeline case it was interesting that they did pay while co while cooperating with the fbi and then the fbi was able to uh, put their hands on, on the attackers and get back part of the money, uh -huh. tracing it back. So I guess here the key was working together with the governmental entity. And while doing so, they were able to um, get something out of it. Uh, Richard talked about this issue of uh, negotiation with terrorists and having this overall policy. And there's a lot of talk in many countries now uh, about uh, issuing a ransomware payment ban um, and on the other hand, there's been recent academic work pointing out to other interesting uh, other instances and in industries where such bans were issued and moving the negotiation from the private firms to the governments. And actually what we saw in those contexts, this research carried out by uh, Professor Tom Baker from Penn, uh, that the outcome was quite devastating, much more deaths, much less success. Um, <coughs> 
So this is a very uh, uh, tricky issue. What I think is most important in this context is, and I see Australia has figured this out, uh, global global cooperation to put their hand their hands on um, on uh, uh, those carrying out these attacks. Um, beyond that, I agree with everything Richard said. Fair answer. Thanks uh, to you both and thank to Ian for the, for the question. Uh, I would like just to jump into the second question coming from Axel Ferrazzini, friend of us. The question says more and more startups rely on trade secrets. Obviously, once stolen, they are not secrets anymore. What would be the alternatives or recommendations you would make to startups to fight these cybersecurity risks? You know? Hmm. Who jumps? <laughs> All right, go on in. Um, I think it depends very much on uh, the capacity for the startup. Okay. You know, it, it, it's easy to say, beef up your security, your cybersecurity technologies, et cetera, et cetera. But many companies can't, particularly startups, um, it's difficult for them to actually gain the traction to be able to build a full cybersecurity um, environment within within their uh, within their own within their own sort of premises. Um, I think the the key things would be you know making sure that the data is encrypted um, and that the keys are kept very secure. Um, I would recommend and 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 I never thought. For 10 years ago, I would never have thought of that, that I would be saying this, but I would recommend that, that particularly startups, they look at leveraging the capabilities that are available through cloud providers like AWS and Microsoft. They invest millions and millions and millions in security and making sure that the, uh, the their environments are secure and to provide tools at an alarming rate to allow Small small companies to be able to implement security cheaply and if, and easily. Um, they do it. They they you know do, they'll do it much better than than anyone ever could on premise. So I would look to that as as a source of of guidance and a source of assistance for for small company startups in particular. Okay, so I'm going to try and add on to what Richard said. First of all, uh, if we look at data privacy and, and data, uh, uh, data protection, uh, it might provide some clues. One clue might be this concept of data minimization. It's very difficult to steal information that doesn't exist. Uh, so thus perhaps uh, building in policies that you limit the information going around, keep it in specific places, limit communications, that may, might make um, stealing this data more difficult. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, that that will be the last point. Uh, Richard, what was the second point you mentioned? Uh, about cloud and le leverage, right. leveraging the, uh, the capabilities. Right, so I also agree with Richard uh, on that. I wrote recently an extensive paper and I showed that uh, although this goes against the older intuition, uh, crowd, cloud providers have many incentives to maintain a very high level of data security. However, there is a caveat when we do see successful data security attacks on information stored on the cloud, it resulted from faulty deconfigurations of the cloud protections, which is something that sometimes an inexperienced um, integrator might do. And it's very frustrating. You spend so much money. It's like buying this $10,000 uh -huh. um, bicycle and using a $50 lock. So you have to make sure that this final section of your data security that you, when you uh, <clears throat> configure your cloud, you do so uh, correctly and make sure that this last part in the interface is is secure. Yeah, no, I, I fully, fully agree there. The, the, most of the, the major data breaches we see coming out of the cloud are down to human error, okay. pure and simple. Uh, and again, it comes, uh, as I said earlier, this is where users are the first line of the defense. You've got to train train your guys, train your techs properly to, to really understand. If you don't have, as a small startup, if you don't have an IT team or an IT, you know, 
talk directly to the providers like AWS and Microsoft. They have teams that can help rather than trying to rely on maybe somebody who's, you know, you met in the, met in the pub the night before and he's, claims he's a security expert, um, you know, has a beard and long gray hair. And um, But, um, yeah, I mean, definitely reach out. There's resources out there for to, to help. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Axel, I guess you are happy with this deep answer, let's say. Uh, we have time for another question and uh, comes from Victor Rawet-Dotti. The question is, what is your opinion on the US SEC proposal for new rules on cybersecurity governance and incident disclosure? Do you see this as a trend among the regulators worldwide? So I'll say a few words about this. So the Security Exchange Commission has issued uh, additional rules. And I, as I mentioned, these rules, uh, mostly they have two levels. They set a specific standard <clears throat> and they also uh, address this notion of incident disclosure, which is something we see. And this certainly is part of a trend, as Victor mentioned, of uh, breach notifications. And I, I also wrote a paper about this and um, to what extent breach notification is a good policy. Um, uh, and it's, it's an interesting question because um, in some instances, uh, the notification isn't, we need to figure out what we want to achieve by breach notification. Now, um, sometimes the notification is to help uh, ex post entities that, um, um, that suffered from the outcome of, uh, of the breach because information about them was disclosed. Uh, my intuition with the SEC that this is more of an um, ex ante uh, uh, tool which will force or incentivize entities to take additional data security measures because they fear the repercussions of, of the breach. Um, and here in my work, I, I pointed out this issue, and I have to say, I didn't read the new regulation carefully, uh, but sometimes a breach might result from, an, let's say, a nation state action, um, and therefore uh, the punishment to the entity um, that was subject to the breach is too excessive, and, and maybe we should think about setting exclusions for these situations. Another point from the very different direction is, is that various studies looking at stock prices uh, and how they responded to breach notifications and incident responses. So we see a dip and then we see it quickly come back. Um, and if firms see this happening over time, they might see this isn't a big deal. And also be, if there are gonna be a lot of breach notifications, so people, investors are gonna become numb, there's gonna be a numbing effect. Uh, so there's still much to be seen um, and and uh, worked on regarding these notifications as we see them circulating around the group, uh, world, globe, and world. Because if the SEC adopts them, we're going to see other entities adopting them as well. Yeah, I, I would agree that you know that it's definitely a trend that that's coming in now, and, and we see it more and more again as, as different countries and different groups of countries like the EU bring in all the different legislations and everything. Um, as somebody who's been on the receiving end of breach notification um, from, you know, one of the risks that we we are open to, like like many companies, is the supply chain risk, the third party supplier risk. So we've had breach notifications from a number of our suppliers come to us where they've had an incident and they've dealt with it in varying levels of, of success or otherwise but I, you know i think it is an, an incredibly useful tool for the recipient because you you it alerts you to the fact that there has been a breach and that there is a potential for lateral movement that may have happened from that supplier to you depending on how they connect in and it gives you a starting point and a heads up uh, as, a, as a security professional to to really start digging deeply and quickly into into what happened and be able to contain any potential um, you know sort of side effects or or collateral damage from these things. So I think the inter the the rules governing them actually forcing them at a legislative level. I don't know how I don't know how effective that'll be, but I think it's something that even just as a best practice, people organisations should be adopting. Thank you, Richard. Uh, 
it's amazing, but one hour has passed. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I bet you didn't realize, but we have dealt with so many, so many issues. We still have a couple of minutes, and 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 in these couple of minutes before giving the floor to Laurent Mandeirier, and uh, I would like to know whether you can have a last conclusion. Let's say just half a minute, one minute. What what would you say on this topic uh, to? To, to to keep the audience alive, let's say, and, and just just some measures that that the audience could keep for the future. Do you mind to start, Tal? Uh, sure. So I really liked how we broke the discussion up into two aspects as to uh, how cybersecurity could promote um, IP and how IP could promote cybersecurity. On the latter issue, I think there's still a lot to work on. And I think that we might be see changes in the way cybersecurity industry operates. It might become, you know, with time, less of a startup culture, and we'll see more of cybersecurity in big firms. And then we might need to see more regular IP coming in to protect it. So I'm not sure if this is a stable environment that we have more of the trade secret. We have to track this on a dynamic level. Um, and, and there's also various issues to look at, um, at the flip side, but I think that's enough for, for now. Yeah. Thanks, Tal. Richard. Yeah, thanks. It's been a great discussion. And, uh, I, I think for me, key messages that I would, I would uh, have the audience take away is that, uh, cybersecurity is an enabler. It is not the, the, the blocker that it used to be. Um, if you have questions talk to your security teams talk to your IT teams get them to provide to help you build secure um, solutions and, and to approach things in a secure manner um, and at the end of the day you know don't be afraid to ask for help when it comes to security you know you, you, you're not there and you're, you're not on your own and there are people out there who can help be it me security experts be it uh, you know vendors, suppliers. There's a, there's a wealth of opportunity out there. Mm -hmm. So Richard Tal, this is exactly what we expect from a global digital encounter. Yeah, uh, it's not only informative; it has been informative. Is uh, you you have asked more questions than answers, uh, but certainly you have shown us. This is a running exercise. We should come back to this uh, to this topic uh, again and again, at least once a year, once every eighteen months, or something like that. We have opened many, many different issues. The, I, I I had in my agenda uh, also other others we didn't have the possibility to deal with for instance the the relationship between black box and cyber security in artificial intelligence the oh, just just put an example of an endless uh, exercise and we will certainly bring these issues in the future in the global digital encounters tal richard thanks very much uh, welcome thank to you the and now i would like to give the floor to my dear friend professor Laurent. Laurent, you have the floor. Dear, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear uh, <coughs> co-director and moderator, dear Tal, dear Richard, I think we had a fantastic time together. As uh, Manuel DeSantis has mentioned, paving the way to further uh, in-depth activities connected in the Global Digital Encounters Project uh, with cybersecurity and IP. Uh, at the end, uh, after a few, in a few days, you will all receive the registration of today's presentation for all those who are registered. You will receive a list of readings to know further, study, explore further on this very topic. And also a report which is prepared by our splendid Global Digital Encounters support team. So uh, that this is not only the current presentation, but the current presentation has enlightening the whole project. Yes, there will be many, many further digital Global Digital Encounters dedicated to IP and cybersecurity. The, uh, in January, we will hold, of course, our next Global Digital Encounter, which is dedicated to uh, new tech and non-traditional trademarks, 
So something very, very uh, classical for the IP family this time, but something very, very innovative because connected to new tech. This is a topic which is super important for uh, uh, IP operators, for business op operators, and of course for our uh, dearest uh, researchers and senior students, uh, uh, of whom uh, many of them are also connected today at this Global Digital Encounter, and whom I thank for their participation. So, uh, dear uh, participants, we shall now, uh, we really want to uh, thank warmly our uh, speakers and moderators. I would wish to present to all of you, on behalf of the uh, Global Digital Encounters team, our uh, season's greetings for a nice uh, end of the uh, civil year uh, and uh, nice holidays if some of you can have holidays. Uh, I wish uh, all of you all the very best for your professional uh, activities and professional success and also for uh, personal uh, success for the uh, coming year. Thank you very much on behalf of all of us and we meet again in the Global Digital Encounters uh, project for GDE 24 on new tech and non-traditional trademarks in January 2023. All the very best and thanks to all of you. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.